Good morning. Great to see you. Welcome to The Big Questions. Uh, I'm Nicky Campbell. Now, despite complaints from Stephen Gately's partner and 25,000 other people, the Press Complaints Commission has refused to censure the journalist Jan Moyer for her remarks about the boys' own singer's life and death. Our first big question, is the press out of control? Male journalist Harriet Sargent thinks they don't go far enough. The four-year prison sentence handed out to police commander Ali Desai was just the latest in a string of convictions for police corruption. And now the serious and organised crime agency has been asked to investigate the whole British police force. Our next big question, have we lost trust in the police? The former head of the Met will be facing some critics on that one. And it's been Mardi Gras in Rio and Venice where everyone lets their hair down before Lent, eating a pancake on Shrove Tuesday hardly compares. Our last big question, should religion be more fun. We're in Oxford at Witchwood School with an extremely intelligent local audience. And sitting for us on high this morning, we've got for you the Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens, the former commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Ian Blair, and fresh from celebrating EastEnders' 25th birthday, another live appearance, the actress Nina Wadia. <laughs> Good morning all. Now, on the day before Stephen Gately's funeral, Jan Moyer wrote in her Daily Mail column, his death was more than a little sleazy. Uh, now, he'd actually died of a pulmonary edema. The article unleashed a torrent of complaints, but the PCC declined to censure the Daily Mail or Jan Moyer, saying it would be a slide towards censorship. Is the press out of control? Uh, Peter Hitchens... He who is without sin cast the first stone. And so much of this is so nasty, so vindictive, isn't it? No, I don't think so, particularly. And the question that you're asking, is the press out of control, uh, raises the other question, who would you like to control the press? Do you want a controlled press? Do you want to live yeah. in a country where people tell the press what to do? In, in the end, if you, if you want a free press, it's going to have to be privately owned. If it's privately owned, it's going to have to be commercially successful. In the end, in that case, it will reflect very much the taste of the people who want to read it. Do I have to just accept the nastiness in the press? Well, I think accept. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't have any objections to, to, to acts of nastiness yourself, and it doesn't mean that people shouldn't restrain themselves from unnecessary nastiness. There's sometimes nastiness is necessary in criticism of bad things. It, 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 it just does mean that what you shouldn't do is allow yourself to be persuaded into having a country where the press is regulated by law. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Neil Clark, you're a journalist. Well, I agree to a point, but I, I, I don't mm. want to see press curbs, but equally I, I don't think freedom should mean licence. I think the problem today is that sales are really dropping for newspapers and columnists are some columnists are going out their way to be deliberately shocking and outrageous. But we read them. And we're, we're getting more and more of these really nasty pieces which are designed purely to, 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 to shock. But we read those nasty pieces and we buy very often newspapers to read those very columnists, don't we? But there's being a, provocative. Know, but there's a borderline, you know, and I think the line's being crossed with certain articles. I mean, it was not just the Jan Moyer one, but also there was a piece by A.A. Uh, a. Gill when, when he wrote the Sunday Times about his joy in shooting a baboon. And he said he wanted to find out what it was to kill a sentient creature. And the piece was very, very shocking and outrageous. And I, but at, get, at the end of the day, he got lots of hits on the website. And I'm afraid we're just going down this road of becoming more and more shocking. And is this what we want to be doing? But, uh, Sir Ian Blair, there's, a, there's stuff a lot worse than that out there on the internet. People are saying <coughs> anything about anyone out there, aren't they? Yeah, the blogosphere, I think, is a pretty scary place. But returning to your question, I think my view would be we shouldn't have a controlled press. I mean, a free press is an emblem of a democracy. But what we should have is a system that, at least when people complain about it, takes it seriously. Uh, mm, during the yes. last ten yeah. years... <laughs> during the last ten years, the Press Complaints Commission has received 197,000 separate complaints, and they have actually adjudicated in less than 200. <coughs> that is less than 0.75 of a percent. So you're with Max Mosley, um, who, of course, was, was featured heavily... I don't think I am with Max I'm not Mosley. saying you are. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly <laughs> haven't been Sir with Ian, Max please, <laughs> Sir Ian, please let me finish my sentence. <laughs> I, I, I think it's very... I want you to. I think it's very, very important. <laughs> finishing my sentence. Say that to a police officer. Uh, <laughs> but he said that it's years, the, with the PCC, <laughs> it's like the mafia running the local police station. Well, I would be against that as well. But um, <laughs> I think that the key point for me is that self-regulation, as we've 
seen with the House of Commons or mm -hmm. Parliament as a whole, self-regulation is a disaster. But what about the Jan Moyer article? What about the thing that... Well, things I think it was very said? offensive and it was particularly offensive. Doesn't she have the right to offend? Yeah, she mm -hmm. probably does have the right to offend, but if she's got any decency, she wouldn't write it on the day before the funeral. Yes, That's the key point. <laughs> But thank goodness for an out-of-control press. An out-of-control press uh, exposed MPs' expenses. An out-of-control press told I, us I, that the future I haven't king said is, is ad adulterous. And an, an out-of-control press... I haven't said it is out-of-control. I think some parts of it are out-of-control. That's the key but, point. Julian. But, 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 Nicky, I mean, the, the press is controlled. There are at least 70 different laws which actually control press content. Uh, libel law, um, confidentiality, for example. The real problem here, I think, is not that we want Jan Moyer censored for an extremely nasty and snidey piece, but surely censure is something that we could have expected from the Press Complaints Commission because in my view, having spent a whole day examining seven pages of sophistry from the PCC, that article absolutely breaches clause one because it confuses fact, conjecture and supposition and that's what one wants. When, when, censure, when she said healthy and fit 33 year old men do not just climb into their pyjamas and go to sleep it, on the sofa it, never to wake up again. It when simply isn't true. My next door neighbour, who's a young woman, uh, died from an un undetected uh, uh, medical condition. He didn't, also she said he died alone and lonely. His partner apparently was, was, was sleeping next to him, according to his witness statement to, to the Press Complaints Commission. So I think what one wants is censure, not, not censorship. And I don't, I agree with Serene, I don't think the PCC is the organisation to give it. Harriet Sargent, you're right for the mail. Uh, Yes, I don't want to comment on that particular piece, but I, I do think that actually um, uh, we, the libel laws, I think the press should be more out of control myself. I think that uh, the libel laws are too strict. Because the libel laws are so strict, pre again and again, uh, uh, new newspapers have to go for these personal sexual details because they simply can't go for what they should be going. And, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> You know, the press has been that the only institution that, ha that stands with us against a sort of corrupt and greedy political elite. Who else do we have? But we are, look at, the, look at the readership figures, look at the circulation figures. We are fascinated by those personal sexual details. Eight million read The Sun. It's such a successful newspaper, as is the Daily Mail. <coughs> we like reading that stuff. What is this? What does this say about us, Julian? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure who, who this we is. I mean, newspaper readership is, is going down. If you go on the tube and look at people reading the newspapers, most people start from the back. Most people read uh, the sports pages. For that's right, men. men. Oh, no, that's women as well. I've, the I've watched women <laughs> do, 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 do it as well. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not at all sure that people necessarily do want this kind of uh, thing. Some people want it, some of the time, but not everybody all of the time. You're looking, you're looking thoughtful. Yeah, I, I just think that the press needs to be an open book because for the average man in the street who hasn't got access to computers and the internet, that, that's their only way of finding out what's going on in the world. So it needs to be accessible to Mr Average. And is it out of control? No, I don't think so. I think if people don't want to read it, then they don't buy the paper. How would you toughen it up, Julian Petty? Well, as I say, I think that the press in many ways already is over-controlled. Take the 70 laws that, that, that we have, take the libel laws, which are absolutely right, are an absolute uh, barrier to, to freedom of expression. What well, I, would do is I, I, I would start again with... You, the you need money to, to take out a libel action. That's the other problem, isn't it? Yes, you do. But, I, I, I mean, look, in my view, the Press Complaints Commission is what it says on the tin. It's not actually a regulator. It's not a self-regulator. It is a complaints-receiving and complaints-mediating body. What one wants is a a, a, a self-regulating body on which, in my view, senior journalists like uh, Peter, for instance, should play a large role, self-regulating the press, so it's respected both by journalists and readers and by the general public alike. I don't think so. I, I think any steps towards regulation are a pathway which leads in one direction only, and that is to legal restrictions on the press greater than the ones that we have. And the, the libel laws, they, they have their virtues. But you do have to remember that Robert Maxwell was able mm -hmm. to continue in his grotesque frauds and, and, and thieving of, of pension funds yeah. for many years because the libel laws protected him from the journalists who knew this was going on but didn't dare write it because he would have sued them till they were broke. And, and it, we are, we are over-restricted. The other thing that, that, that is a danger here, and this is a, a personal experience I often have, I, I, I make a statement of opinion and I then get letters and emails and telephone calls from people saying, 
you have offended me. Your opinion is offensive. Uh, you have insulted me. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, all I've done is disagreed with them. Mm. But there's an attempt to have this the, the, a, a censorship of, of, of offense. People saying, you can't say that because it's annoyed me. And we're very rapidly, particularly with political correctness, moving towards a state where there are a number of things which just cannot be said anymore. <laughs> A regulatory, body, a regulatory body of the kind which you describe would rapidly turn into a, into a monster of oppression if it were allowed to exist. And the thing I is, Serene, we stop it before it begins. Serene it's Blair, tempting, which should stay, those stay things, away from Those things are said if you just go and read people's blogs and look at the comments about uh, articles. And you touched on it early on with the so-called blogosphere. People are saying this stuff anyway, and newspapers, in a sense, are playing catch-up. Yeah, I just think the thin end of the wedge argument <coughs> is, is always, to me, a bit shaky. I mean, it was the same one as being run on the assisted suicide debate, that we move from assisted suicide, thin end of wedge, into compulsory euthanasia. There is nothing to stop. There is nothing to stop the press actually having... A, a system that is actually does deal with the complaints as opposed to <laughs> not dealing with the complaints which is just it doesn't work and therefore I completely agree with Julian we've just got to start again with that and get it with a bit of teeth that does not make the end of a free press what Maybe. are these teeth what are these teeth? Well, who, the teeth who, would be... And, and, and who bites? The, the teeth would be quite how, how long is it before? How long is it before the Inspector Plod is round at the offices of such and such a newspaper or television uh, station yeah. saying, I'm taking you away because what you said was unacceptable? How oh, long is Peter, it? Peter, Peter, how, 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 how long is it since we actually did go around breaking the presses? I think that was probably about the 16th century. Um, this is not where we're at. We're actually just saying... More that, recent than that, actually. We're just saying that there needs to be a place in which somebody who feels that they have been affronted... Uh, can go and say the way I was treated was unfair, and somebody will say yes, it is, and then put the piece, the, the information back on the same page. And Nina, the problem That's is the, the problem is offending story page two, apology page forty-two. Yeah, yeah, agreed. No, this is, <clears throat> excuse me. The saddest part about all of this is the fact that Stephen Gately, you know, um, has has his family has been absolutely distraught by what has been done and written. The last person that anyone ever thinks about is the actual victim. And I find that really sad. Keith, did you find that was a situation with you? Because you were wrongly accused of disposing of a dead body in, in, in a murder trial. You were completely exonerated. It was in 2002, ultimately. And some dreadful things were written about you in the press, weren't they? Well, the press seemed to have a free hand in sort of blackening your name as black as po they possibly can. They seemed to highlight on the prosecution side, because that's all the juice in the sleazy bits... Um, <clears throat> less so on the defence. And then, of course, the other pro problem you get is they then start putting quotes in different, different order and making something sound completely different. And then all so the there's a lot of irrelevant stuff in there, yeah, the, about your sexuality the good, and so yeah, forth. The good yeah. bits, but the middle bits, oh, they're boring, we'll leave those out. Um, and then also, I mean, they'll come up with headlines like guilty before the, the jury have even gone out. During the trial, we had <coughs> headlines saying, uh, guilty, high and wire. That's surely contempt of court. Well, we but you, you, think, you we think they play fast and loose. <coughs> and what's it, what, do you, what do you feel it's done to your reputation? Not, not only that, the particular paper were, worked in very close link with the local police. They were given information. They knew prior information that... Even we didn't. We know. have a police debate coming up yes. on this programme, yeah. and I'm sure you'll but be contributing the, to that. When these things go wrong, yeah. as they all do, I mean, whoever it is, you know, if, if mistakes are made, put your hands up and say, look, we've made a terrible mistake, and be sorry for it, but they don't do that. Have you complained? Well, I didn't, because, I mean, at the time, I was, I was completely shot to pieces. I mean, you know, I, I spent two years with, you know, psychiatrists and God knows what, pills and... Mm. You know, so you don't think about this. And solicitors, as good as they are, they're not particularly. They don't come up with things. So, oh, there are ex clearly there are excesses, and you had a, you had a dreadful situation. But what but I'm saying is, they they don't come back. They they did pages and pages and pages of all this blackness about and me. And then it's gone and it's forgotten it's as far as they're concerned. But, they but it's not forgotten as far when as you're concerned. After the appeal, yeah. they don't come yeah. back. So we're very sorry and look at this and look at this and you're. This guy's not been given com compensation. Why not? Mm. And they should be investigating that sort of thing.
a, 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 a dreadful situation, an appalling experience for you, but in the broader point, Neil Clark, and I think that Peter Hitchens touched on this, a far more appalling prospect than uh, a, a, an uncontrolled press is a controlled press. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with Peter 100%. But I think P Peter's a good example because he doesn't shy away from dealing with controversial topics in his columns. He, he talks well, you could about, say that of John Moyer, couldn't yeah, you? Well, he talks about immigration, he talks about morality, about Christianity, etc. But he doesn't do it in, in a deliberately offensive and nasty way. And I think the trouble is now, in, in the sort of ratings war for readers, some columnists are going out of their way to be deliberately controversial. Mm. Uh, there was a column in, the, in one of the papers where after Michael Jackson died and said, well, his greatest talent was sleeping with children. And, of course, that got a lot of, you know... Michael Jackson fans writing in. It was a deliberately outrageous comment to make. If you don't like it, don't read it, surely. So, so that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. You know. yeah, absolutely. If you don't like it, don't read it. But isn't it a regulate sign of the society someone. we are where, where unfortunately some people are trying to but deliberately... But if, if, if you want to regulate freedom. someone, regulate yourself. But freedom shouldn't mean licence. It shouldn't... You know, I've got the... You know, free speech is right. We should, as journalists, tackle controversial topics. But however, if you but, were to censor mm. certain pieces, where would you stop? But I'm just Would you stop at Jane Moore? Would you stop if someone wrote something offensive about these, religion but, but, or your favourite football team? These, these topics can be uh, debated in a more civilised way without being deliberately nasty <laughs> and just write up. I mean... Shane, I'll come to you in a second, but Shane, first of all. It, it, it's trying to define civility, and it's not about if you don't like it, don't read it. The most important thing with what we're discussing with the press is if you don't like it, you find them consistently offensive, don't buy it, yeah. which is a stark yeah. contrast. Yeah. Which, which, which is a stark contrast to what we have with the uh, channel that we're watching at but the moment. If you're offended by what's on the BBC, you don't have any choice. Um, Mr Sirian's uh, 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 former colleagues will come down and arrest you for not paying your licence fee. At least with the press, well, we on. have... We yeah. have well, they we can have turn over, choice. though. Don't. <laughs> but they could, they could turn over. I, I mean, this is a licence fee debate, which is a, a, an interesting one, but a slightly different debate. Yeah, what would you like to say? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, two things. One is, I think people get offended. That's part of life, and we need to just accept that we're going to get offended by mm -hmm. some things. In life. And the second is, seeing the rubbish in the papers is the only way I know that the stuff I want to read is also being allowed to be published. It's the only way I can be sure that every viewer is being heard. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy for us, though. I mean, you've had nasty things written about you, as of you, as of you, as of I. We're in a public eye. That just goes with the territory. The problem is people like, people like Keith, uh, Peter Hitchens. Well, I think Keith has, has a legitimate point. I personally think that the contempt laws are not being adequately enforced at the moment. I, when I was trained to do what I do now, there were very strict rules about what you could say about trials in progress. And they seem to have just <coughs> faded away. And I, I'm shocked often at the way judges let mm. things happen, which would never have been allowed to happen when I first started court reporting. Mm. And I, I tend to sympathise with him. That you're supposed to give a fair and accurate account. It's, it's what gives you the privilege to report the court in the first place. But uh, the, the, you, on the other hand, you do have to take a certain amount of stuff. Look, there's a, there's, there's a Facebook site of, called Peter Hitchens Must Die. Uh, <laughs> if I had the technical competence, I'd go on it. I mean, it's a statement of truth apart from anything else, but it... it, it, <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> so what? I mean, pe people say all kinds of things about me, and I, 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 I may not particularly enjoy it all the time, but in the end, you have to say, all right, too bad. Uh, that's, that's the price. But if something the, is beyond the pale, what about stopping a print run or a massive fine for Ian Blair? Something no, like no, that. I, I think the issue is not. I, I, I want to go back to one of Peter's questions to me, which is what would be the recompense? The recompense is for Keith is that the same level of, the same page is where the, the apology or the rectification takes place. This idea that you, uh, you, you put it all on the front page and you apologise at page 97 is just nonsense. Can you imagine what would happen? <laughs> Can you begin to imagine what would happen to newspapers if there were an enforceable right of that kind? Which, by the way, the British National Party, I think, is in favour of for its... Uh, for well, I'm not a member of the British reasons. National Party. No, it's, it's interesting that, it's, that, that your no, thoughts you coincide us. with them on this. Well, that's, that's they, really... They, nice. they, they, they certainly used to be one of their policies. Just imagine what's what would wrong, happen... What's wrong with that policy? Well, Keith, what, what do you think about papers? that policy? No, no, I mean, the trouble is the papers, they can influence juries on their decisions. Well, that's, that's what right. they shouldn't be able to do. I mean, the so judge... The contempt rules are supposed the, to prevent Yeah, the that. judge... Uh, no, they say, you don't read anything, don't do this. I mean, this latest thing where they're um, saying, you know, don't go on Google. That's the first thing any of these juries are going to do is go straight onto Google, looking into the case, trying to be the detective and trying to solve the case. That's wrong. <laughs>
serious. In, in, in my view, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a statutory right of reply. Lots of countries have it. I think your, your, yours, Peter, is a council of despair because if there was a right of reply, journalists would take care to be much more accurate in, in what, the, what they write. No one's disputing your right or my right to be offensive. But being offensive is fine and should be allowed. What people dislike is factual inaccuracy. And what they particularly like is... Um, the confusion of fact and opinion. If there was a right of reply, journalists would take more care about what they write. If every week Parliament passes, every week Parliament passes the law of unintended consequences. It makes a law which it thinks will do good, which does bad. This is one such law. If you, if you proposed that, it would look good and people would say how wonderful. The effects of it would be an iron censorship. I well, promise you. That we're going to leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>
and that usually low-level crime was just totally ignored, so that actually we never reported anything. Why has this bother. happened? Why has this happened? <laughs> Uh, well, I think there's a number of reasons. I think that the, an awful lot of the time that the police are policing to the centre, they're policing to the Home Office, rather than policing to what their local communities want. I think that is the main problem. Sir Ian Blair? Well, actually, I tend to agree with Harriet, which is why I tried to change it in London. Um, that's why we invented a thing called Safer Neighbourhoods, which produced... 10% uh, of the force working directly with local mm. people, unable to do anything else, not to be removed, and you and I have discussed that before, mm. uh, Harriet. But I think the other thing that's going on with the police, there are two things, really. One is you still have to look at the polls that say which organisations are trusted, and the police is still very much at the top end of the market of trust. You have, what, 46%? As, op as opposed to... Um, satisfaction uh, rate. Yeah, it's not a lot, is it? No, it, no it's, it's not. I'm, but I've mentioned... Well, I will mention now, there is a problem about public trust for all public institutions. But with the exception of nurses and doctors, the police are the next group who are most trusted. More trusted than a number of other professions, certainly more trusted than journalists, more trusted than politicians, and I'm not going to mention the state agents either. Yeah. So there's, there's a whole issue here about public trust. The second thing that's going on is the mission of the service is being pushed in two directions. It's going upwards into organised criminality and terrorism, which is obviously a pretty major concern. And it's going downwards, as it were, to antisocial behaviour, because the agencies and agents of social cohesion, like park keepers, caretakers, bus conductors, have disappeared, and the only people left... Well, is it going downward into antisocial behaviour, which yes, is a is. huge concern? I mean, Superintendent Steve Howard, the head of Leicestershire Police, after the terrible Fiona Pilkington affair recently, said... Um, at the inquest, he said low-level hooliganism was the responsibility of local councils. Well, I tell you, police. I, I will just say I thought that was, in, in my professional view, entirely yes, and utterly incorrect. Mm. Uh, yes. And it, unless the police tackle low-level uh, antisocial behaviour, uh, you allow the habitat to grow, which is what would happen. Of course, uh, Estelle from Newham, um, you're from the Newham project, Newham monitoring Newham project. Monitoring. Is, that, is that your your experience as well, Estelle? I, I find it laughable what what Ian's saying about public having confidence in the police. Our experience from working with individuals and families who have suffered police violence, <coughs> harassment, being stopped and searched is that they they don't have confidence in the police. And actually, I. I find it quite funny when, when you, you are defending having a, a good complaints body for the press when you presided over the Metropolitan Police um, organisation and yet that had no, no proper complaints body. The Independent Police Complaints Body, which was, you know, has, has never proved itself to be an organisation with teeth, and, and Sir Ian was, was one of the, the people who actually stepped in in the Menezes case, for example, and actually stopped, blocked the IPCC from coming in to investigate. You were the person who lost public confidence in that situation. Well, well, Serena, I think Serena should come back on that, Peter. With, uh, with, it's uh, a private uh, means. Uh, and then I, you can come yeah, back. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very uh, conscious I mean, uh, when I thought about the remarks about the Press Complaints Commission that somebody would come back about the police service. But the difference between the two is that the, what's happening with the police operation is there will be different points of view. There's got to be evidence gained. With the press, it's either there or it isn't on the page. There's no investigation is necessary. <laughs> no. But uh, if I can just mention the Menethes case... I have explained again and again and again as to why I took that decision. Uh, and the suggestion that it was in any way a cover-up is nonsensical because the letter that I wrote was to the Permanent Secretary of the Home Office, to the Chairman of the Independent Police Complaints Authority and to the Metropolitan Police Authority. So it was a decision. I've had to live with the consequences of that decision. No. The IPCC was set up after, after Stephen Lawrence, basically, and one of its roles was to gain public confidence. One of the promises it made was to step in immediately when there was a death in custody and gather evidence straight away so it wouldn't be lost again like it was in the Lawrence case. The Menezes family will never know if they've got the true picture of what, what happened to Jean when, when he died because the, there was no investigation for, for seven days no. after his death. Sorry, just no. It was, we, 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 we'll deal with that off the uh, sure, sure, and it's not something that we, we want to no, focus on sure. too much now. It's been <laughs> debated many times before. Uh, uh, important, uh, important as it is, Estelle, Peter Hitchens. Well, the main problem with the police is surely not what they do, but what they don't do. Mm. I think in, in most of our experience, if the police, the whole lot of them, were abducted by aliens tonight, mm -hmm. most of us wouldn't notice any difference, because yeah. they're That's never, so. ever there. Yeah. 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 I, there are more police officers in this country, both as an absolute number and per head of population, than there have ever been. 
And, and they're more you, accountable. And if you say, if you say they're well, more accountable, accountable than accountable they've ever been. Home office accountable to politically correct pressure groups, maybe not to us. <laughs> the more the, 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 they simply have disappeared from the streets. Their job was defined originally, and there's never been a better use of them, as patrolling the streets on foot to prevent crime. You ask them to do it, they say, well, we haven't got the facilities. They're overhead, they've got an air force. If there's a football match, they turn up in regiments, thousands of them. If you want to patrol your street, they won't come. They're not interested. They, 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 they turn up as a fire brigade after crime when a policeman is no more use than you or I, unless he's very good at first aid. They're there to prevent crime. Not so really, one second, but Sue... They don't do it. Sue, they're on, they're on your estate, aren't they? They are. The Barton abso estate. Absolutely Again, on our near estate. Here. Yeah. Just ten minutes down the road. If I'd have been sat here ten years ago having this conversation, I would have agreed with you 100%. But we've moved on from that. And can I say to you, ten years ago, we witnessed joyriding, smell of burning rubber, assaults, muggings, burglaries, car crime, actually in front of you. And it was ongoing. You would call the police, they would float in in their panda cars, they would drive around and they would float back out again. So that actually supports the argument you've got now. And now? But now, um, here we are today, we've got a neighbourhood policing office based on the estate. And if I go back two years, the priorities for the police on our estate were antisocial behaviour, drug dealing and drug use. At a neighbourhood action group meeting only a couple of months ago, the top priority for that area, and bearing in mind this is an area of high deprivation, mm -hmm. and number one is dog fouling. Number two is litter. So that ch shows how we've changed our fortunes, and that's all been achieved through having police back into estates, locally based, not wasting time coming from their main police office to the so estate. It's a success story, so hurry, mm. in, in a minute, Paul, I will bring I, you in. Yeah, when I was doing my sorry. report, I spent about 10 months going around the country, and where this neighbourhood policing, I just to support this lady, it really worked. Mm. But, and I interviewed a number of places, exactly your story really worked. But, unfortunately, it's been cut back. Um, the finances are just not there. I mean, I interviewed one young policeman who did a huge, a great job in his area, in Yorkshire, um, and now he's been told he can't concentrate on his neighbourhood. He has to go and solve crimes elsewhere. Mm. And he said, you know, the whole thing's fallen there's apart. There's different stories in Oxford. It's not the situation with you. You were going on about how they were, you know, they were paying high-level drug dealers and letting well, them off. And well, uh, I think this is accepted across the board, isn't it? Not just in Oxford. But I mean, one indication that. Um, that people have lost faith in the police is the number of pensioners that come to me. I'm one of the elected representatives. The number of pensioners that come to me saying that they feel completely let down by the police. Why do we have the experience that Sue has? Sue well, I think, has the, I think in, in, therein lies the problem because um, it's a lack of resources. It's a political thing. You know, it's, it's the amount of uh, resources that the government give to the police to do, to do the job. And the fact is, if they're on your estate, they're not on our estate. But it's not you know. just the police alone. Police need the assistance and help of other agencies. We've had, we've been very privileged and we're very lucky that we've had huge amounts of investment through the local authority. Um, they've looked at local crime hotspots. They've dealt with it. They've taken away the hiding places for the criminals. Um, they, they've brought in um, lots of other facilities. The youth service are there. Um, so throwing money at it is effective. Pa Paul McKeever, Sergeant Paul McKeever. But not enough money, I'm afraid. But what about, mm. what about... Oh, it's, it's, it's not worth it. Paul McKeever first, we're we not heard from Paul yet. It's, is it really worth... If my, my car got broken into last week, it wasn't worth reporting it. Unless you want a crime number, it's not worth reporting it. Nobody's going to do anything about it, are they? Well, it, it should be uh, important, and I, I think we have lost our way a little bit when it comes to that. We're putting people out on the streets to show... Uh, the public that we're there uh, and trying to instill confidence and yet we lose that confidence when 40 percent of crimes go uninvestigated we have to change that uh, can i say in relation to your problem in blackbird lees we will talk about that after the program we'll sort that criminal out i'll tell you now the um which, it, which criminal is that the one that's being paid by the police <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, but we have to sort that out. We have to sort that yeah, out. Yeah, but we're on a live TV uh, debate. It'd be nice to debate this issue. I did ask what the panels and, and your what about your paying, opinion paying, was. Can I just say, I, I don't know about the particular problem that's no, going on. Regular, to we're we're talking about steroids. We can't hear the intricacies of this right now. But is it regular to pay high-level drug dealers as informants? 
Uh, it is part of the toolkit, yeah, mm. to, to actually deal with the Even if that serious and organised crime. Even drugs across working the, class well, areas. Well, we'll talk about that work. afterwards and we'll try and do something about it and sort it out yeah, because again, it, it sounds public, very peculiar to me. Okay, like Peter to Hitchens, you were going to come in. Go well, on. Can I just answer yeah, what Peter I, was saying earlier in relation to the, uh, the picture he describes of the police? It's a very different picture to the one that's picked up by the polling agencies like Ipsos Mori who show that, uh, as Sir Ian says, that we are consistently way up there in, in trust and public confidence. Paul, if, I may, have, uh, Paul, if uh, I may, this is, I think this yeah. is important. You have 46% approval rating, but you are the upholders of the law. Should it not be a lot higher than that? Higher. Well, Ipsos Mori, it's a lot higher than that, but let's, let's not get into the figures. So the, 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 pro the, pro the popularity of the police does not generally survive contact with them. People think they're good because they still have in their minds Dixon of Doc Green and the, the thin blue line. Then they actually have to deal with the police, and as most of us find when we want them, they won't come, they can't find us, or they're not interested. And it actually is no good, I'm afraid, making a special concession out of policing and well, housing I have to come state. back in there. Uh, I have to come really, back in. To say, in well, actually, in this, in this estate, we've now got the police. How wonderful. Why didn't you have the police there before? Yeah. Well, well, doesn't I have, everybody I have, to, you have? I have to come in on the particular point that... <laughs> And there was a health supplement in a newspaper a few months ago in which a, a policewoman was, was, was interviewed and she said, well, I have terrible problems putting on weight because policing is a sedentary occupation. Now, that, is, that sums it up. <laughs> the job of the police fundamentally is doing paperwork. And if they can find some time while doing the paperwork okay. to come out into the streets, very, that's okay, great. Very quickly, Paul, then I'm going to come to Sarina and to, to and Nina. We are, we are the visible manifestation of the criminal justice system. I think there is a failing within the criminal justice system when there's a 70% reoffending rate uh, of those who go through it. We have to get the sanction right. Uh, and we have to ask the question of politicians, how many times do you want us as police officers to arrest criminals before they're dealt with no, the effectively criminal justice criminal system? Because the the they're system going system around the, again no, no, and again no, 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 and again. So you're, you're doing missing, your bit. We are. This entirely misses the point. The criminal justice system is actually a measure of failure. Every crime that is committed is a failure of the police who are there to prevent crime. But we have an arrest to statistics, stop it, and it doesn't Arrest happen. statistics, prosecutions, meaningless. Sir Ian Blair. If you don't prevent crime, you're not doing any good. And Nina, Nina, you're next. Sir Ian Blair <laughs> first. Because <laughs> I want to hear what you think about the, uh, the stop and search situation and profiling as well, the experience of some of your friends. But Sir Ian Blair, has bureaucracy and political correctness got in the way of good policing? I mean, Ali Desai, he got away with a load of stuff because you were so terrified of being accused of being racist, weren't you? I, I'll, I'll just say I'm, I'm not going to comment on Ali Desai. That's a matter for the current commissioner. That, that's one of my unwritten rules is I never speak do you know, about Do you know him? This. Ali Desai, mm. yes, I know mm. him extremely well. Mm. Um, this, what I think is being described here is, is one is a matter for police leadership. The Met decided it was going to restore foot patrol and did restore foot patrol and that's what the safer neighborhoods programs are all about in london what's been described in barton is an image of that that is what we can deliver um, i totally i absolutely appalled occasionally by what i hear sometimes the idea that uh, antisocial behavior is a matter of the local authority is blinding nonsense uh, the health some of the health and safety some of the human <coughs> rights stuff that's been described is just a complete mistake. Mm. The police don't get it right all the time. Why can you why can why can you comment on that, but not on Ali Desai or the general point about the, the the terror of being accused of being racist? I've heard it referred to as institutional anti-racism, and it, it, it did it hamper the police? I think the extraordinary experience of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry on the Metropolitan Police will have had an effect. I mean, it just does. That that level of scrutiny has an effect, but I think gradually. We have changed. We have also changed very significantly in our recruitment. We're now running at 20% recruitment from minorities, which is obviously <coughs> showing that we're welcoming uh, minorities into the organisation and they're trusting us enough to join, which is great. On the subject, which I think you're going to get onto in a minute, about profiling, I mean, that is a really difficult issue, particularly around terrorism. We all suffer from the issue that sits at airports where everybody gets searched and, it's, and so on. But we do know broadly where the terrorists we've seen so far have been coming from and it is a logical question is do we start to profile in that direction we don't do it completely because otherwise the terrorists will it's send common old sense policing, is it? there's a bit of common sense mm. policing in there and, Nina it's funny you should mention airports just very very briefly I want to tell you about my experience coming back in from New York over Christmas where you were saying this long line for screening and then there were four queues to get our bags checked um, and literally, depending on the colour of your skin, mm. you were sent into each line. It was literally that bad. So if you were white, you went through the fast line and you went right the way to the end, you were cleared through customs. 
anyone who was Indian, black or Hispanic went into three separate queues. I'm glad to say that we don't have that in this country. I've not experienced that yet, but I'm telling you, I think we are one step away from that right now. Estelle? The idea of profiling people is fundamentally is, is going to fail in the fight against terrorism because you end up alienating the very communities or com communities at large that you should be working with. It creates distrust, uh, a lack of faith in the so police. So it's not and common sense policing? It's not common sense. And if you, if you look at stop and search, I mean, the stop and search for terrorism has never managed to, to catch a terrorist or, or, or yeah, lead to a successful that's terrorism that's prosecution. A lack of understanding of the issue. Uh, when it comes to terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism, uh, you don't have to be of a certain colour of skin to sign up to Islamic fundamentalism. For example, the head of Al-Qaeda in uh, America is uh, a white person, middle class, studied at an Ivy League university, uh, and you would never think that person is a terrorist. So profiling is doomed to fail, because if the recruiters can't recruit from Southeast Asia, they'll only end up recruiting on our streets. <laughs> And you were going to say something. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can I bring it back down to the question, really, and to street level? Um, because if, if, there, if there's a lack of uh, trust in the police, is it because the police don't get the backing from the justice system? Uh, and, and are they demoralised, yeah. really, is my question. Uh, I mean, if I could very briefly tell you about an old uh, elderly lady last year, went to London, 80 years old, her handbag was knocked off of her hand. Uh, she went, the, the police obviously took over, uh, and really they said to her, look, it will never catch him, we can't find him, and even if we did, nothing could happen to him. Now, is that not really where the lack of uh, faith or trust yeah. in the police... As a, for, Sir Ian Blair, then, as a former cop, would you say to people, whatever's happened to them, whether it's been something major, which of course they will report, or something very, very minor, which is an, an irritation, an annoyance, even a bit of graffiti, low-level vandalism, which uh, is terrible for local communities. Should they go to the police? Should they and can they have confidence in the police? Well, I, I think they should go, and I would very hope very much they will have the confidence that. Because this is the thing I described about the habitat. People don't define crime by the stati criminal statistics. They define it by the smash bus stop, the needles and the condoms in the stairway, the louts in the children's playground. Mm -hmm. That is what the whole policing of neighbourhoods is about. I agree with Peter's point that the preventative patrol is exactly the right approach. On the other hand, the police have some other things to do which you can't solve by preventative patrol, like investigating murder, combating terrorism, dealing with paedophilia, dealing with fraud. I mean, there is a bit of policing that cannot be done by a man in a, or woman in a blue uniform walking around. OK, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> and join, join the debate by logging on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions, follow the link to our message board, send us your thoughts about our last debate. Should religion be more fun? Uh, you can find details on our web page of how to be in our audience. We are in Exeter next week, Tunbridge on March the 7th, and Newcastle the week after that. Now, in Brazil, there's uh, Mardi Gras with scantily clad girls shaking their um, tail feathers. Uh, uh, here we tossed pancakes. In India, Holi, the festival of colours, is about to kick off, where revellers fling paint at each other. Uh, well, we'll be lucky to paint hard-boiled eggs for Easter, really, here, won't we? Should religion be more fun? You say yes, the Reverend Ben Norton, because you've got this XY church, which is for, for blokes. You meet in the pub, you go go-karting and paintballing, and you wear tracksuit tops, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's all good stuff. What's it all about? Absolutely. Uh, church and faith should be fun because it reflects life, doesn't it? Um, church, for me, is about God and it's about people. And joy. Uh, yeah, and then two things coming together. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it's always going to be fun because I believe it's about journeying well and journeying well with each other and journeying well with God. And there's going to be high times and low times, uh, painful times uh, and times of, of great fun uh, and food and parties as well. But the laughs and the exuberance and the food and the fun and the parties, there yeah. are very important. That's what, that's what Jesus was all about. Well, that's what our main service is all about. It's the Eucharist. It's, mm. it's set round a meal, you know, and, and sharing a meal with someone, you share so much more. Mm. And go-kart, yeah. <laughs> and go-karting. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the guys that I, I mix with, we, 
we build relationships, build community with them. I'm part of, um, I'm a pioneer minister in the Church of England, part of the Fresh Expressions movement that was thought up by the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, that's uh, part of the Church of England, the Methodist Church at UIC. There's a great new wave of connecting with our society that sits alongside our inherited ways as well. It's a mixed economy of, of finding both because we live in such yeah. a diverse community. Yeah, a mixed economy, that's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah, 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 Rachel. Um, you, you advise people in the Church of England, don't you? Yes. Um, do you advise them to have more fun? Would that be one, of, one bit of advice from you? Um, it's, it's a good piece of advice, but also I think it's to be engaging is the main thing. Yeah. It's to be relevant. Um, and we've put lots of hurdles in the way between often um, people who are, would be interested in finding out more about the Christian faith. Often we put so many hurdles and obstacles in the way, we want to take those away. It's a little bit stern, a bit yeah, serious, we want a bit po-faced. Yeah, so we've, mm. um, it's a wonderful um, movement created by a lady called Lucy Moore called Messy Church. If you've got small children, sometimes taking them to church is an endurance test for you, an endurance test for them. But if you walk in and there's glue and sticky tape and lots of things to do and engage the children, and then you have um, like the parables of Jesus, they're, they're fun stories, and if they're told in a vibrant way, not only can the children engage, so can the adults. Are the parables fun? Was Jesus fun? Yes. I can, can you imagine a group like his disciples not having fun? I mean, they're, they're fishermen, they're tax they, they were a vibrant group of real men. I feel that they were probably had more in common with Ben's group of go-karting yeah. um, guys than, than often we've made them out to be. Is that how you see it, Ben? Absolutely. It's about meeting people. Twelve guys together. Yeah. Where, where they're Going at. For I mean, a pint. The, the group that, that we have down the pub uh, on a Sunday night, we take a topic, I mean a bit like this really, we take a topic that's been in the news and we sit and discuss it uh, over a pint. Uh, now, some of us on the table uh, have a strong faith, and so the issues that we bring yeah. bring a faith perspective. But then other people bring other worldviews. And I tell you what, it's helped me in my faith, engaging with other people yeah. in this world. Can <laughs> Peter come go-karting with you? <laughs> I, I Definitely. Yeah. Are you going to go go-karting <laughs> with the guys? No. I, the, <laughs> I'm afraid few things in life more terrifying than a Macy Vicar. Uh, I, I, I just don't know quite what's going on here. Uh, the, at the bottom of it seems to me this confusion that a lot of us have these days between pleasure and happiness, which are two entirely different things. And the idea that by having pleasure uh, you're spreading happiness is actually false. And it certainly has very little to do with religion. I, I'm surprised at anyone describing the, the, the parables as being fun. Most of them end with uh, people being cast into the outer darkness amid wailing and gnashing of teeth. And if you find that uh, the ones that I read do. Uh, if you find that fun, then that's your bag, but it's not mine. Isn't your glass a bit half empty, Peter? Isn't, isn't, your, <laughs> isn't your religion, no, you're, religion, you're preparing is a, for death. That's religion celebrating is a, life. Religion is about death. It's about well, preparing it's about... for it. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Those are, the, those are the things you have to be concerned about. It's not about fun. Religion if you say death. it's about fun, you'll well, miss we're, we're not a happy club. We're not here to make people feel better. But we are about exploring issues of peace and, and joy. And for me, my faith gives me both of them. And exploring that with other people allows me to get them more and, and, and in a deeper way. Because, like I say, it's about God and it's about people. I have to live my faith out with other people. Otherwise, there's no point to it. It's have about, fun. Yeah, and it's about making a difference in the world and allowing that joy to come through. Uh, well, sorry, 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 in a second, but a whole row of hands got here. And I know you're, there's your whole row of, I don't know what the collective term is for atheists, a whole row of atheists here. Good morning to you. Good morning. Who wants, who wants, I'm uh, sorry? What a about happiness the, of atheists. A happiness of atheists. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the dogma of religion? Sorry? Is homophobia fun? And, and how is can, the oppression of women fun? Yes. How can you reconcile what? joy with uh, a seven-year-old <coughs> girl being told that she will burn in hell because she doesn't believe in God? And what religion do you have in mind? Would it be only the Christian religion or the one that is issuing fatwa just because somebody doesn't agree with somebody, uh, somebody's no, writing? Not a lot of fun. Or, or, yeah. or uh, the, the, the stigma of uh, sin, the stigma of you know, women not being equal to, to be uh, bishops or, or other things, or gay people not being uh, as anybody else. How can you at all talk about fun? Nina, do you want to... Yeah. 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 Between the parables, between what you're saying, I think, see, I think it already is fun. I think instead of watching EastEnders, we should actually <laughs> act out the Bible, act out bits from everything. <coughs> Seriously, because I, I, I love what you're doing, by the way. I love the fact that you are bringing people in from everywhere, 
talking about things, getting people engaged to talk about, about religion and faith, because actually a lot of people are forgetting about it. They want to move on. But because Peter they find says it's it. about death, religion. It's so... Oh, well, <laughs> as you say, everyone must die at some point, but I don't want my child to be born and start telling her at the age of six months. <laughs> now, prepare for your death from now. I think that really is looking at it in a very, very wrong way and looking at it, as you said, you know, glass half empty <coughs> as opposed to glass half full. So, you keep, so you keep, you'll keep the Easter story from your child until when? <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't keep anything. I, I want my child to discover everything from a human point of view. I want yeah. my child yeah. to explore any religion that they want to as they grow up. That's what I want them to do. But the Easter story is a story of joy and a story of peace. We all and go through times of suffering and pain and hardship, and that's exactly what Christ went through. But you can't have the Easter story without the resurrection, can you? No. Nope. Which You've is the story the of joy and The resurrection, home. that's the punchline, is it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You that's can't the have party. the resurrection that's... without the death. <laughs> no, but we can't have life without <laughs> suffering. You can't have joy without pain. You can't have... Exactly. It, it, should it's it not be Siri and Blair? Does Peter not have a point? It's a serious oh. business. It's a, it's a <laughs> mysterious business, and it's about mystery and majesty and sin and redemption. It, it's it, not it, about paint bowling. Uh, to me, uh, it's Cecil B. DeMille. I mean, do you remember the story of John Wayne as the Roman centurion uh, in the film, uh, the greatest story ever told, and he says, truly this man was the son of God, and Cecil B. DeMille shouts at him and says, you must put some more ore in. So he says, ore, truly this man was the son of <laughs> yeah. God. Um, but I think the key point here is that human beings react to mystery, to, to power and glory, and what we have in certainly the Christian religion, what makes me a Christian, is that something happened after that crucifixion, which changed... I mean, of all the extraordinary stories to go out and tell, these people went out and told a story that a man had risen from the dead, and it doesn't matter whether you're Zoroastrian, Jewish, Sikh, or anything else... Because neither is Zoroastrian. Story, yeah. I know, that's why I said it. Mm. Uh, it's, it's because that story is totally impossible, and yet those men were prepared to go and die to say something that everybody they ever met was impossible. See, that right. is awe. A uh, 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 whole row of hands up there, but I know what you're going to say. <laughs> David Foster, I will, I'll come to you if I get the opportunity. We haven't heard from David yet, and also Dr Ramsey, but David, you want, you want the Mass in Latin to come back, don't yes, you? Yes, I'm from an organisation called the Latin Mass Society, and we campaign in the Catholic Church for more use of Latin liturgy, uh, traditional Gregorian chant, and traditional devotions and prayers. There's not a lot of paintballing <coughs> where you come uh, from. No, no but, but do remember, things like the Mardi Gras, they are part of Catholic tradition, so mm. there's plenty in well, but the Latin tradition, Mass, which it's is going to be, fun. to most people, it's like mm. in the Middle Ages, it's going to be something they're excluded from, and because they're excluded, they think, oh, something <coughs> amazing is going on the other side of the screen, we can smell the incense, mm. we can hear the Mass, but it's... It's, it's going to be gobbledygook. Only Boris Johnson's going to understand what's going <laughs> on. Possibly not even him. But, you know, I think there is, there's something to be said for, for, for the transcendent. Lots of people in religion today are looking for transcendence, something on the other side, a meaning in life. Uh, you start with your go-karting by all means. We've got to move on from that. Remember, Jesus with the disciples, they were blokey, they had suppers, then they went up onto the mountain and communed with God. Mm. We're talking about that side of religion, the communing with God, uh, the asceticism, uh, the devotion, the, the, the sense of mystery, the awe and wonder. The, the that's what we're that promoting. It su surpasseth all understanding, that's the point. I think, as the prayer says, surpasseth all understanding. Yeah. And, you know, Latin may surpass the understanding of most of us, especially at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, uh, <laughs> but, you know, as, it, as, as mass might often be. Uh, but e even so, there's something to be gained from tackling things you don't understand. Rachel? I was going to say, it, we, we're looking for all and everything, and um, it's about life and vibrancy, as well as um, having sorrow. When, you, when you're in a community of people, if something drastic has happened, then you've got to, you've got to grieve with them, or you've got to celebrate. And um, what you're saying about the awe and mystery, for some people, that's exactly what they're looking for. So there's been... It's a, it's a, it's a reflection of culture, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, there's a goth, goth You've got the West Highland Free Presbyterian Minister is yeah. very stern. You've got the Pentecostal yeah. Caribbean preacher. That's it, we preacher. need their vibrancy. It's, and yeah, somehow exactly. God Depends is on our own cultures in the very, very often. Do Dr Ramsey, uh, Islam isn't, isn't renowned for its laughs. Uh, no, no, not at all. Of course, uh, uh, religion in, in, uh, as a whole is about uh, enjoyment. We believe the enjoyment, not a fun. You can't find, uh, uh, make a fun and mockery of the religion. It's a very respectable because when you go into the churches, to the mosque or to the synagogue, uh, you, are, you are going in front of, metaphorically, in front of the Almighty God with the respect. There is, has to be respect. And no religion, no, none of the books, they say you don't enjoy it. As you can ask the, every person, <clears throat> 
which are coming from the Friday, uh, Friday uh, coming from the uh, from the Friday prayers, and and the Saturday from the synagogue, and and the Sunday from uh, from the churches. Ask it, did you enjoy it or not? And they say, yes, we did enjoy it, and we got it solely, solely enjoyment spiritually. It looked like a jar, which is empty. During, and end of the week, you go in and fill it up with the Holy Spirit. And enjoy yourself when you're talking to the Lord, a good Lord. This is very important. We remember that. But, but can it be fun? Can you have fun? Uh, a tambourine, a, a guitar. No, no, no. It is not because I, uh, do, do you do it? <laughs> it is imp it's impossible. Please, uh, if you want to have a fun like this, go to the pub. Go to the nightclub. <laughs> go to other one. Why you want to mix the beautiful thing like that? Beautiful, spiritual. As our honorable friend says, it is about, of course, it is about well, the listen, remembering an interesting, the death. There's an interesting the, statistic. 48% yes. um, of uh, black people in this country attend a church. Uh, the yes. community as a whole, it's only 15%. Now, what is that? Those are vibrant churches. They're happy places. They're places yeah. where they have music Absolutely. and they dance and they... You, David. But I was just going to say, that, that, is, that is true. But we've also found in the last few years an upsurge of in, in traditional forms of worship. So Latin masses, for example, <laughs> plenty of young people, uh, young families, uh, young priests who are interested in finding something beyond what we had in the 60s and 70s. Now, I'm not saying everyone's ready for that, but I'd say do think about incorporating some of that in your religious life. Yeah, uh, some thoughts. I'll, I'll try and come to you. Yes, go on. What would you like to say? Yeah. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, I think um, religion, or maybe speaking from um, a Christian uh, perspective, has to do with balance. And uh, we've got the body, the soul, and the spirit. And all these areas have to be balanced. Mm. And I believe, you know, like what uh, the Reverend was saying, you know, your, your life has to be balanced in, in, in every area. We need the fun. We need the spiritual aspect. And Jesus must have been fun. He must have had moments of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about the gentleman with the beard? <laughs> The bib trying to biblical pick, beard. Yeah, I'm trying to pick one of two, um, but I'll focus on the one. If, so if I was to go to a mosque and I was to participate and I left and I said I didn't enjoy it, it sounds to me like you're saying I'm wrong. But you shouldn't go to the mosque. Uh, apologies, you shouldn't go to the mosque but, if you don't enjoy it. But it, it sounds to me you're saying I should who, enjoy it. The people who enjoy it, the people who enjoy it, they go, they're, not comp they're not compulsory to push you into the mosque. You can go if you like to the church, to the synagogue. You can change your it's religion not compulsory, if you like. And it's not, we don't have to go yeah. paintballing with you, do yes, we? It's, 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 not it's not compulsory. Not, it's it's not, not, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A bit of go-karting. There is no force in the religion. A couple of pints of lager. It's my idea of a night out. Yes, sir. Good morning. How big is God? I mean, God plays every scene of life. I think God is too small sometimes. We have a bigger vision of God. Yeah, yeah. Is it not a reflection of ourselves, of our own culture? There is that point, isn't there, Sir Ian Blair? We have very different manifestations of what we think religion is and what we think spirituality is, and they are dictated to by very often where we live and where we've grown up. I think that's right. I mean, I think we've lost the sense of one path being exclusive. I think that's really important. Mm. And there's a sense that there are many, uh, many paths to the top of the mountain, uh, and but the idea of living without, as the gentleman was saying over there, without a sense of the spirit, without a sense of the soul, it seems to me to be a very bold experiment, mm. I've got to say. But and uh, holy the religious festival in India, that's about the triumph of good over evil, and that's yes. something to shout from the rooftops about, shout Absolutely. from the top of the mountain about. Absolutely. You know, I... I... I, I, sorry, I have to say, I, I don't think that if you have fun in, in exploring religion and discovering religion that you necessarily are being disrespectful to it. I think you should be able to, as you say, find that balance so that you can learn about it and, and you know... It, it, should be, sorry, it should be within the, within the frame of the religion. Absolutely. You respect the place. But no you one's saying go that. If you're going go you're not Muhammad disrespecting had fun. Christianity. Uh, absolutely. He had fun. But before, for example, before the ceremony, they sit in together, maybe perhaps a disciple of the Jesus, Jesus as well. They have all found one when you're going toward the Almighty God, when you're going metaphorically speaking to Almighty God, you should have sure, a respect. Sure, but some people believe that it's Almighty God important. is within themselves. You know, no, 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 no. We, we have to show. Where it is it is it is it is we should show the outside. As ever, the debates continue not only in the studio, but on our message board. Join us from Exeter.